Up until then, I had killed many Germans. I, I won't tell you. This is one secret. Because you must keep in mind that if you run across a dog driving, would you ever forget that? You could never forget that, that bump. It will haunt you for the rest of your life. Imagine if you killed a human being. You're not going to forget that. Well, I killed many. But uh, this was at a time when I was still a sergeant, not an officer yet. And the machine gun on the second floor had been firing at us and killed one of the men. And I was angry. We charged up there. There were three Germans, two were dead, and one was alive, but he was sitting on the floor, back against the wall. His legs were wounded. His hands were up, kamarad, kamarad. And I didn't speak German worth anything. So I proceeded towards him. Then suddenly he stuck his hand in his jacket, like this. My initial and natural reaction was, this fool is going for his gun. So I swung my rifle up, hit his face on the butt, and he was dead. His hand flew out, and out came a packet of photographs of his wife and kids. That's what he wanted to show me, that he was a father, he was married, he's got children, so be good to me. I killed him. You don't forget that. And so I told the chaplain, I said, I don't think I can continue doing this. He says, well, the war is still on, and if we don't put them away, they're going to put us away. So reluctantly, I went along. I didn't enjoy my work. Up until then, I must admit, I enjoyed it. And men who have served, some of them have experienced this. To this day, I cannot fathom this, but I was a young corporal, a sergeant, leading a contact patrol from my battalion to the next battalion. And we were walking along the trail, and all of a sudden I looked up on a hill not too far away, and here's this German. He's crouched. He's defecating. Nothing glamorous about this. And uh, I told them, that's mine. Get down. I set my sights carefully. Boom. And the men all came up to me. Terrific, Dan. Terrific. Killed a human being. Terrific. And I felt good. You know, I'm a Sunday school teacher, and I felt good. When I think about it, um, that's one of the horrors of war, that you can change a person, train them to hate, train them to kill. It's a terrible thought. You would think that no one can change you, your soul, your heart, your compassion. But here I was, I shot this German, and I was proud. And the men around me came around, terrific, Dad. How can you forget that? That was number one. But this is a secret I don't know if I should share with you, but uh, in my younger days, when I was a sergeant, I ran the biggest crap game in the regiment. <laughs> That's achievement. But not to make money. I gave them away. Because I didn't want to write home and tell my mother, 
I'm a gambler because you know, she would die. And so I didn't save anything. I gave it all away. And so my, my game was very popular. The losers got their money back. And uh, I saved two silver dollars. And I carried them with me in a bag, a little packet, as a good luck charm. Because those two dollars had saved my life. Because a bullet struck the coin, went off instead of entering my body. So I kept them. The day I got my final injury, I looked for my coin, they were gone. It must have slipped out. So I knew something was going to happen. In fact, I told the platoon leader of the next platoon, I said, today I get it. He said, you're crazy. I said, no, I know I get it. Hope it's not too bad. I was an officer then, first lieutenant. And about a week before this attack, we had an officer's meeting. And the captain says, I want you to pledge silence. You're not going to tell anyone what transpires in this room. Okay. His words were very simple. The war is over. Looked at him. What do you mean the war is over? They're still shooting. They are now negotiating. So be careful. Keep up the pressure because you don't want to prolong the war. You want to end it fast, so put the pressure on, but be careful. Well, at that point, uh, you don't want your men to be wounded. So keeping that in mind, moving up. On that day, I was wounded a couple of times. The first one, I thought somebody punched me in the stomach, but no one was around. A bullet had gone through my abdomen. Believe it or not, it just felt like a punch, but there's no pain nerves inside. The pain nerves are on your surface. It is much more painful if somebody stepped on your toe. <laughs> so I kept on going. The bleeding was very minor, and it wasn't fatal at that point. And then um, we were confronted by three machine gun nests. To show you how lucky I am, but I knew this was the day. The first one, boom. Second one, boom until a grenade launcher aimed directly at me. Instead of hitting me here, it hit my arm. Now that's luck. Don't you think so? And uh, I lost my arm, but uh, I was still alive. Until I got hit in the leg, then I couldn't walk. I must have looked terrible because with blood gushing out, I've got this submachine gun, brrr, like the movies. <laughs>
Army, Navy, Air Force surrendered. If you think back to the African war, they surrendered. They sunk the Navy, the aircraft were all burnt. One division refused to surrender, the Bersaliari. They were the, I would say, the successors to the Praetorian Guards. In the old days, the Praetorian Guards protected Caesar, the dictator. These Bersaliari troops, crack troops, protected the king. And their attitude was, we will put down our arms if the king tells us to do so. Well, the king was nowhere around. It was run by Mussolini. So they fought until the end of the war, and these brave fellows, when the war came to an end, I think there were less than 500 out of the whole division. And uh, so if you go to my office, you'll see the hat and the plaque. I'm a member of the Bersaliari because years later, I'm a senator now, chairman of the Defense Committee. I was in Rome as part of the negotiating team to the use of Aviano, the airport. And after the negotiations were finished, I looked at the prime minister and I said, uh, I'm looking for someone who fought with the Bersaliari. And he says, why? And I told him, these were brave men. None of them ever surrendered. They fought until they were killed or wounded. And I just want to shake their hands to say that it was an honor fighting them. He says, this general is in charge. A battalion of Bersaliari was run by a four-star general. That's how important they were. I'm supposed to be a normal, sane type person, but after you go through war and such, you become superstitious. I am convinced that somebody is looking after me. Now, for example, uh, when I was wounded the last time, I was wounded four times. That's how lucky I am. None of them killed me. The last one was a terrible one. The arm flew off and everything else. It took nine hours to evacuate me. I was wounded just about noontime, but I stuck around until three when I felt that the platoon was in shape. Then I said, I'm ready to go. From three to midnight, because everything was on stretcher. Today, if I had been wounded under the same circumstances, I would have been evacuated by helicopter and I'd be in a hospital within 30 minutes. As a result, in my regiment, the regiment I served in, no double amputee survived because they bled to death. No brain injury survived. And um, that's what nature of war was like. So here I am, I get to the hospital at midnight. I'm in a room about, oh, five times the size as a tent. And you can see hundreds of stretchers lined up. And some of the men are dead, some are se severely wounded. And there were about three, four teams of doctors and nurses going up and down the line. And they're mumbling. But after a while, I'm watching them. And it became very clear that they were deciding this one immediately in the surgical room because he needs treatment. Next one, you can wait. Not that serious. The third category, God bless you. Well, when the doctors came by and the nurses, they looked me over and they put me in that category. Category three, that 
they said goodbye. Yeah? Because the hospital had so much in resources and so many nurses and so many doctors and so many beds, they couldn't accommodate all. And some of them were already dead or unconscious. So when the chaplain came by and he's following the doctors, he came by and, and he looked at me, son, God loves you. I said, oh yes, I know God loves me. I love God too, but I'm not ready to see him. He looked at me, he said, you're serious, aren't you? I said, absolutely, I'm not ready to go yet. He ran up to the doctors and I don't know what he said, he's mumbling away. Doctors came back, looked me over, shipped me out right away to the operating room. I had to do my first surgical procedure without anesthesia because they were afraid that I might not wake up. See how lucky I am? I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. In fact, I can just about picture it for you, across the Pacific Club. And ironically, the Pacific Club was a club for the titans of industry the big boys. But I think it might be a bit more interesting if I told you a few years before then. My grandparents from the southern island of Japan, Kyushu, walked all the way from Kyushu to Tokyo, Yokohama, to get on a ship. And this was in 1st of July, I believe, or 4th of July on the Shanghai Maru. It took about 30 days, arrived in Honolulu about 25th of July, 1899, to work in a plantation. They were given about three days of health examinations and such. And on the 28th, they were shipped off to the island of Kauai. And there they worked in the plantations for over 20 years. They had a goal to make $300 because the family had a debt that had to be paid, which was a matter of honor for them. And my father was, had gone over as a child of two. But about that time, a law was passed by the United States, making it impossible for any one of these immigrants to become naturalized, no matter how good they were. Or, but that was the beginning. My father was, I would say, a Buddhist. My grandparents were Buddhist. My mother, on the other hand, was a child of immigrant parents also from Hiroshima on the island of Maui. But uh, at the time of birth, her mother died. And then her father died four years later. So here she was literally on the street because her father was a plantation worker and no longer in existence. So that house went to the next worker. But fortunately, about a month after his passing, a young Hawaiian couple came by, took her by the hand and took her home and in the Hawaiian fashion, adopted her, Hanai. Well, she was also brought up as a Buddhist, as a child, but uh, about a year after the Hawaiian family had discovered her, she was also discovered by the Methodist pastor in Lahaina, and he took the attitude, orphans belong in orphanages. And so shipped her off to Honolulu as a young child. But here, everything changes. She went to the orphanage, and on the first Sunday afternoon, all the young girls of Asian extraction were lined up, and the bishop of the church came by, and they went through the ritual. 
what is your name? What would you like? And the answer was always a piece of candy. My mother had no idea what it was. So she said, I want a home. And the bishop took her home, believe it or not. And she was adopted by the bishop. So until she passed away, her two sisters were blonde and blue eyed, a brother blonde and blue eyed, and her father's name was Daniel Kleinfelter, Dr. Bishop Daniel Kleinfeld. I'm named after him. So that's my beginning. They're all public schools. I went to kindergarten and I had a lovely time there. It was an Episcopal kindergarten. My mother and my father were Methodists, but uh, I became uh, very proudly the holder of the cross. And that was a big time for me at the age of four, walking down the aisle. So that was my first big achievement. And on Christmas Eve, I was the first king in the Three Kings of Orient. So that was another great achievement. I'll never forget those days. They were good days. I was the eldest son. And from as early as I can recall, it was pounded into me that you are the eldest son. You are to make certain sacrifices and the word honor. Can you imagine a three-year-old kid being lectured about honor? But that became a key word. For example, when I left Hawaii to put on the uniform, I was 18 years old. My father and I were on a streetcar going towards the departure point. And the only thing he said was, whatever you do, do not dishonor the family, do not dishonor the country. And if you must die, die with honor. I'm an 18 year old kid and he's telling me that. And I understood exactly what he meant. And uh, well, I was the eldest, I had a sister right below me and two brothers. The first motivating teacher came about in my first year in high school. Now, if you can picture me at that time, we hardly wore shoes. And uh, as I told a committee once, a committee that questioned my application for the Honor Society, why don't you wear shoes? And I told them very clearly, shoes are for funerals, church services, weddings, and extraordinary days. Otherwise, I'm barefooted. And that's the way most of my colleagues were, young kids. We all lived in enclaves, a Japanese area, Filipino area, Chinese, Hawaiian. But in school, we were all together. And uh, most of the teachers were white but most of the students were either Asian, Polynesian, and a few white. And uh, in Hawaii, this may sound strange, at that time, those of Portuguese ancestry didn't consider themselves white. We are Portuguese. They were very proud of it very insular people, hardworking, but they always differentiated themselves. So when we say white in Hawaii, in my generation, it did not include Portuguese. So in uh, elementary school, I'd say it was 1% white and the rest were us. It's the same thing in intermediate school. 
and high school. High school, I think the largest group were Japanese ancestry. We had segregated school system. And most people don't remember that because that's a long, long time ago. It was called English Standard Schools. You had to pass certain examinations, not just written, but the spoken language. And usually, those of us who came from these enclaves would not make the tests because, for example, I took the test just for the hell of it. And I got a perfect paper. But when I faced a teacher, she immediately knew I spoke pigeon. And uh, I flunked. <laughs> but that's the way it was. English standard schools, uh, it was a public school. About 10% were non-white, 90% were white. This went on until about 1956, and it was completely wiped out then. When I was in the seventh grade, I, during one of the sporting events, wrestling, I fell the wrong way and I fractured my elbow, compound fracture. It was rather bad. The bone protruded, but somehow, my parents couldn't afford a first-class orthopedic surgeon, so believe it or not, we got one of these uh, uh, judo specialists, like a sports physician. And naturally, he didn't do a good job because this was a compound fracture. But uh, to make a long story short, my mother finally took me to Shriners and got hold of Dr. Craig, a very important person. He was the head orthopedic surgeon. He looked me over and he says, okay. And we had surgery, turned out well, good enough to be admitted into the service. I never forgot him because about a week after my surgery, my mother and I went to his office. And there, my mother said, it may take us a lifetime, but I'll pay you. He said, did I ever mention a fee? Said, All you do is pay for the operating room, which is $25. And my services, your payment will be, you'll be a good student. So here I was. Right then, then I said, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I was about 16 then, in first year in high school, because um, a lot of the kids took part, and I wanted to know something about first aid. Not because I wanted to be a doctor, but uh, I thought first aid was fine. Then in 1941, when I was then a rather senior fellow, even at the age of 17, I was in charge of all the medical aid men. We had this aid station. This is in 1941 just before the attack. So when the attack came, our aid stations were already set. Now these aid stations were for local problems. Ambulance, we had an ambulance and it worked out well. So I, I worked in the aid station on a night shift and went to school during the day. And on December the 7th, I don't know whether you call it an honor, but people tell me that I picked up the first civilian dead. Uh, 
And somehow I did not faint or throw up. I did my job. I was, like the rest of the family, getting ready for church Sunday, December 7th, 1941. And as every Sunday, I'd have the little radio on, listening to music. And the disc jockey would say, and the next song is this and this and this. And he'd be playing, and I'm putting on my necktie, and all of a sudden he started screaming. The Japs are bombing us. This is no exercise. And I said, well, this is crazy. It must be part of the show, you know? Because Orson Welles was in something like that just about that time. So I didn't take it seriously, but then he kept on it, screaming and yelling, no music. So I decided to go out and I looked out towards Pearl Harbor and my God, there are puffs, anti-aircraft and aircraft flying. And all of a sudden, three of them flew above us, above me. It was gray with red dots on the wing. I knew they were Japanese. I used some profanity then, but I figured the world had come to an end. Uh, so I called my father and said, you better come out and take a look. And uh, I immediately knew what I had to do. I took off my Sunday clothes, put on my work clothes, went to the aid station. And I was away for about a week. On the first day, I was in charge of that team, stretcher team. The first was a woman, I'll never forget. Part of her head was sliced off. Shrapnel. But ironically, it happened that these shells were our shells. The, in the excitement, the crew in charge of their anti-aircraft battery had forgotten to put the timer on. See, the shells have to have a timer so that when it gets up to some certain height, it explodes. Sometimes you want it lower, sometimes you want it higher. But this time they forgot to do it, so it just went up and down and hit the ground and exploded. And so it just happened that it hit right in our neighborhood. And so the first one was this old lady having breakfast. The second one was about six people. The shops had just opened. And the worst one was a mother holding her child. Her head was sliced off, her legs were sliced off, and the baby's head top and the bottom. And uh, there's a little story to this because that afternoon, the husband who happened to be away on the other side of the island doing some work, came back when the war started and looked for his family, came to the aid station, is, is my wife wounded? You know? And I said, yes, I'd like to see you. I said, no. And he insisted and the doctor said, show it to him. I said, Doc, if you showed that remains to him, he's gonna go nuts. Sure enough, he ended up in the insane asylum. That's how it happens. So I was ready for the war. I had gone to the draft board to say, I wanna sign up. And they said, no, you're 4C. I had no idea what 4C was. So I had to inquire, what is a 4C? Your enemy. To be told by a fellow American, do you an enemy? You know, that's stunning. I, I could never forget that. I was just 18 at that time. And uh, 
like most young men, I wanted to serve my country, put on a uniform and do our business. Well, about three weeks after the bombing, we got word that we of Japanese ancestry were declared to be 4C. 1A is physically fit, mentally alert. 4F is something's wrong with you physically or mentally. 4C is a designation for enemy alien. I was made an enemy. And as a result, I, would, I was not qualified to put on a uniform, so I couldn't be drafted, I couldn't volunteer. So we got together, Japanese Americans, and began petitioning the president and saying, look, give us a, an opportunity to show our stuff. And in uh, December of 1942, a decision was made, was announced in January, that uh, they'll take volunteers to form a Japanese American regiment. And 85% of those in Hawaii who were qualified volunteered. Pretty good. Well, to make a long story short, I got in at 18. I was second to the last to get in because I was exempted. Because I was in the aid station. And I was in college as pre-med. And doctors, pre-med, were set aside as essential. And those of us in the age station were considered essential. So I quit school, I quit my job, and I went back. I said, I'm ready. So I got in. I was one of the youngest in the regiment. And, uh, but I got a commission. I was too young, but they gave me a commission when I was 20. But at the age of 19, I was a platoon leader. Well, a decision had been made just about the same time to put them all in camps. So initially they were put in whatever was available, and so thousands spent time in Santa Anita racetrack where the horses slept. <laughs> and uh, those were strange days for them. And when the camps were made, they were just wooden shacks. They were shipped off to far away desolate places in New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Arkansas, away from big cities and such. 120,000 of them. And none of them had committed a crime. And later on after the war, when investigations were held, not a single violator of the law. Everything was censored. The newspapers were all censored. There were people who knew about it, but not a young kid of, of 17 and 18. And uh, I had no idea when we got on the ship to go to California, it was my first trip outside Hawaii. We had no idea where we were headed for. And when we got to Oakland, the word came down we were going to Mississippi. And the only thing that most of us could think about in Mississippi was what we read. They lynched people there. Well, that's what you read in the papers, you know. And so, the outlook wasn't that good. And we got on the train, and we were told that whenever we approached a city, a word will come down and we bring down the shade. Understandably, because if we went through this railroad station and the shades were up, 
and people looked in and saw me, they would think I'm a prisoner of war. I look Asian, so they thought the best way to avoid problems just to lock up the train. And we would lift up the shade when we left the town or the village or the city. So we saw beautiful America, Grand Canyon and places like that. But uh, when we got to Mississippi, this must have been about five days later, we expected the worst. And lo and behold, there were about 50 women lined up at the train station in gray Red Cross uniform. They were all white women. And it was quite an eye-opener because in Hawaii, I had never been served by a white woman. Because well, most of the waitresses and waiters where I went to dine in a little coffee shop and such were all Japanese or Chinese or Filipinos. And so this was elegant white ladies serving us coffee and donuts. And then uh, later on, several families opened their farms and invited us to come over. But the real kicker was the USO. About a month after we arrived there, they sent an invitation. We're having a dance for you. So if you're interested, we'll be at this auditorium, what have you. And uh, I decided I'd go. My first dance was with a blonde. <laughs> Never had one before. That's achievement. But uh, when you consider coming up with the background I had, it was an achievement. And how can you ever forget that? It was very pleasant. There's so many. And it gave us a little drive that America wasn't bad. Even if they declared that I was an enemy alien, and I was an enemy alien until the end of the war. We got more than the usual basic training because we trained as a unit, not to train us to be shipped off to some division or some regiment. We were a special unit, and as such, we became a combat team. We had our own artillery, our own engineers, our own medic. So it was a unit that could be deployed anywhere, self-sufficient. You must keep in mind that my mother was a devout Methodist. She was a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, saloon busters, you know? So going to church was part of my life. At the time of December the 7th, I was a Sunday school teacher, sang in a choir, and so I, I would say I was a good Christian boy. Believed in the Bible, I still do, Ten Commandments. And so here I am now in uniform, and we get out to the firing range, and I find that I'm the best shot in the company. And I couldn't make sense out of that because I'd never fired a gun in my life. And the instructor said, that's why you're good. You have no bad habits. You just follow instructions. So my first assignment, which lasted about a month, I was a sniper. But then they made me an assistant squad leader, so they gave me a couple of stripes. Went overseas as such. But in the first battle, everything happens. A squad leader gets killed. I become squad leader. And before you know it, I was platoon leader. It's a mess. 18, shave twice a week. <laughs> there was only one person younger than me. And I had to convince 
my fellow soldiers that I was worthy of being a sergeant. And these guys are older, bigger, and I'm a Sunday school teacher. I had to do a lot of things to prove to them that don't mess with me. In the beginning, most of our officers were Caucasian, white. But as we moved along in the war, uh, they had a policy, my colonel had a policy, if there were men worthy of leadership, we make them leaders. And on my 20th birthday, they submitted my name. I had no idea. I figured I was too young at that age. But one day I found out I was a lieutenant. I was surprised. It was something I knew that a study had been made because a bill had been introduced to study to see if distinguished service crosses can be upgraded, not just for us, but for throughout the Army. And 21 of us got upgraded. And I've always felt that uh, if I am deserving of the Medal of Honor, there are many, many others who are. And I, I felt a little bad receiving it. I, so I received it in behalf of the fellas because there's no such thing as a single-handed war. There's always a support group. And if you didn't have people who supported you, you can't fight a war. The bill that we have provided, which has always been passed by the Senate, as it's part of the administration's request, but it was always balanced. So much money income, so much we spend. But uh, it's a heavy load because I'm also chairman of the subcommittee on defense appropriations, and we're engaged in two wars now plus a few other small ones around the world. And it takes a lot of money. The other thing is uh, most people may not think about it, but the aftermath of war is very costly. Costly not just in lives, but the treatment because of the efficiency of our transportation system, efficiency of our medical technicians, people are surviving. If you go to Walter Reed right now, you'll see dozens of double amputees, and you'll see triple amputees and quadruple amputees, which was almost impossible in World War II. They did not survive. We had one of the highest casualties in Europe, my regiment. We we're also the most decorated in the history of the United States. But no double amputee survived, and I know we had several. No brain injury survived. So what happens? Imagine yourself as a wife, and you have to look at a brain injury husband for the rest of your life, and he can't talk to you, but we're paying for this. That's the easy part, the money payment, but how do you pay for the misery? So, if we can, we should be able to avoid war. It's a dream where you live a life that you aspire for, one in which you can 
get married if you want to, raise kids if you want to, get educated to the limit of your capacity, and do what makes you happy. Because we all are looking for a good life. We don't want to go through life of just fighting, fighting, fighting. I've gone through life. I got into the Congress when we had just started Vietnam. Before that, I had friends going to Korea. My brothers went to Korea. And it was war after war after war. Today we have a powerful military that serves as a deterrent. But the enemy we have today is not like World War II where you sign a piece of paper and the war is over. And today they're not in uniform. In my time, we knew what the enemy looked like. We knew his weapon system and such. Today, your cab driver may be the person. You have no idea. I don't know how we got into this fix, but uh, we're there. Thank you so much for talking with us today. I appreciate it. Aloha. Aloha.